Hi there, welcome to The Art of Transformation. I'm your host, Mark Sheff. And in this episode, I get to talk to one of my friends, John Morris. He is the CEO of Nowhere, which is an immersive experiential online space unlike anything you've ever seen. I'll, I'm going to link to that in the show notes. But you know, the funny thing about John is I met John well before I ever realized I met him. I'd gone to a theater show in New York with the woman who was later to become my wife. We were standing in a small crowd. There were no seats and there were these platforms around us. And on one of those platforms was a man in a suit and there was a generated wind, this huge fan. He was up above us and the wind was blowing and started blowing all this stuff, like big boxes. And this man in this suit was leaping and running and jumping and pushing against the wind. And it was just this incredible display of physical theater. Many years later, after becoming friends with John, I found out that he was actually that man in the suit. And he went on to create all kinds of what he calls audience-centered design experiences. He's done this for people like Nine Inch Nails and really big organizations you know, all over the world. But the pandemic changed all that. And he pivoted to this new idea that he's also hoping will change the world. We get into some of these ideas in this episode. I hope you'll listen and enjoy it, and I will see you on the other side. Good evening, good morning, what time is it? Hey everybody, <laughs> welcome back to the show. Uh, as you just heard, I'm here with my good friend, John Morris. John, my man, so good to have you. So good to be here, Mark. It's awesome to see you. I know, I feel like I see you mostly on the internet, even though we live very close to each other. <laughs> But, I know uh, it's like the it's like the curse of New York friends, you know. It's like oh, once totally. you once you move beyond a, a neighborhood, then it's like, wait a minute, I got to go to that other neighborhood. <laughs> well, you know, a friend of mine just convinced me to invest in a um, a scooter, like a little mm -hmm. electric, like a like a little hand scooter, not like a cool scooter, like a little <laughs> hand scooter. But I feel like <laughs> I might have unlocked the the bridge between Williamsburg and Clinton Hill and maybe I'll maybe I'll maybe I'll venture over yep. there. <laughs> I have this I have this theory that the longer you live in a place, the the smaller the field of comfort of travel becomes. You know? So like when you first move to a city, you're like, oh I'll go anywhere. Yo, oh, you want me to meet you up there for a drink? I'll be there. I'll be there. It's like the you know city. <laughs> And then the longer you're there in that city, like, it just starts shrinking and shrinking, shrinking. Maybe that's a metaphor for life, too, like how, how much, you know, we leave our homes. That would, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's an age thing. Maybe it's a New York thing. I mean, for a very long time, I've resisted going to Manhattan for almost any reason. And, uh, and now, yeah, no, for sure. And age kids. Although, had a blast at indoor surfing with you guys a couple months ago. Oh, yeah. Still, still a high point of my year. Um, the, and some, the best you know, reason actually, to go to New Jersey. <laughs> it's mm, the only maybe. So, so, so sorry, no shade New on New Jersey. Jersey. Sorry, New Jersey people. We, we love I, you. I America. go to New Jersey almost every weekend. But um, segue into into the show. I am an athlete. I'm I'm pretty happy with my ability to kind of pick up new things. And I was terrible at indoor surfing. Just. Mm. Back of the pack. It was fine. It was fine. I had a great time, but I just fell on my face 99 out of 101 of those times. You were up quite a bit. You know, I've been, I, I've been kind of transitioning in my life. You know, I've been an athlete my whole life, you know, like yourself. And it's like the health, like physical health is a really important aspect of my well being. And I've been know. trying to find like new sports because I was always a basketball player as my main, you know, outlet of, of training, but besides like my own, my work as a performer, but I think surfing is my old man sport. I think I'm going to go yeah. from now. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm transitioning from basketball now into tennis. And then I'm prepping to transition from tennis to surfing eventually in the next like 10 to 15 years. So, so I have been surfing more and I've been trying to find more opportunities, you know, and this indoor surfing is awesome. Cause you can basically, it feels like you get indoor. a year of surfing in like two hours. Cause you get like oh, 20 man. waves. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. You, you'd think that it makes it easier. Now I've, I've been surfing out in, in, uh, in the ocean just a handful of times, but felt very, very good. Like I could get up, you know, get on a wave, go for a little bit. I obviously have a lot to learn, but like, I was like, I got up on the thing. Holy cow. Like, even though you knew exactly <laughs> when the wave was coming and you're like, start paddling now. It's like, it's a video game, you know, AB, AB select start. Just, it's a formula. <laughs> yeah. Like really like couldn't, I have some friends. I have some friends in jujitsu who will go surfing after after training, 
Um, mm. I don't know if it's an, I, I don't know if it's an old man sport, but it does. It seems like it's something that you could continue and continue to improve over the course of you know whatever our our, our second half here. It's actually such a beautiful metaphor for transformation. I mean, sports metaphors, you know, they work because they're true. But like watching in our group, there was maybe 20 of us. And you saw yeah. the two, there were like two older guys who were obviously like pro. And and you <laughs> would watch it. them and they would position themselves in the exact place. And then they would maybe do like one, two paddles, like easy paddles, yeah. like not with yeah. no effort. Meanwhile, yeah. like, you know, most of us are like, they're like, okay, paddle. And then we're like starting to paddle and they're like, no, 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 really paddle. And then we're like paddling ferociously. And then we barely oh, yeah. catch the wave. And these guys are like, Woo, whoosh. And then they're on the wave and already surfing. And then they surf all the way in. It's like such a metaphor for all the things you do in life of like, yeah. you know, when you, when you don't know, you're just basically like, tr like paddling like a maniac, like a ferret. And then when you get, right. you know, really comfortable and really good and you, you know, you learn how to not expend unnecessary effort you know, then okay. everything is just like a, a smooth and easy paddle into a much fun wave. Yeah, I like that. Maybe. Like as, as you as you gain more experience, you learn how to. And this we talk about this a lot on the show. How to do less but better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this let's is something just a I, bit. I I feel oh, like no, I go, go on. I was just going to say, like, you know, with all the things I've done in my life, I think I've rarely gotten to the two paddle situation. <laughs> I think maybe I just really enjoy swimming really hard <laughs> and fast to try to get well, somewhere. Like, you know, I, I, I seem you. to be making progress, but I don't know. I feel like I'm swimming hard all the time. Let's talk about that, because I've known you. Uh, I don't even know how. I mean, God, it's been probably 50. 15 16 years now some i think i met you like mm -hmm. maybe even before i moved to new york might be even longer than that and um i remember before i even knew you actually when i was visiting new york in 2006 we went to go see this show called where's a brute and um later found out that our now good friend john morris was the guy hitting boxes doing stuff in this like incredible <laughs> like very visceral very physical live show so Take us, take us through a little bit. Give us kind of the highlights from, from this, you know, uh, you know, I think it was off-Broadway. It was, you know, it was in, in New York City mm -hmm. performance. Very, very popular show. From yeah. there to some of the things that you've done to something that I don't think any of us could have predicted 16 years ago to what you're doing now. Just give, give, us, give us a little bit of the arc. Sure. My career kind of falls in three phases. There's... The performance phase, which you're speaking of with Forza Bruta, then there's the kind of installation experience design phase with Windmill Factory, and now the nowhere, um, more digital phase to try to expand that. And essentially how that all happened was, you know, since I was a kid, I was always doing athletics, um, and then I was always doing acting. And then I mm. wanted to kind of pave a future into a career that would allow me to to use my physical abilities, but um, but be performing. And so... You know, I had a fellowship out of college to, you know, study physical theater around the world. And then I had a 15 year career in physical theater. Um, and that led me all around to, you know, from, you know, wearing like full, you know, monocolor yellow suits fishing out over, a, uh, you know, a new mall <laughs> to, you know, being a clown at Cirque du Soleil and then starring in this show for Zabruta that you're mentioning, which was a, a a massive show in Union Square. It comes from Argentina. Dude. It's toured around the world, 300 to 500 people a night, top off Broadway show in New York, um, sold out for many, many years. I think it ran for eight years. I was in it for four, four years of that, 1,200 shows. And I definitely, in that show, got to the two paddle face <laughs> of, of like, you know, I could, I, I could come in and do that show at any moment and feel like I was nailing it. Um, and it, and it really, and while I was in that show, it, it was the first time in my life where I'd had a steady job. Um, and it was a four year, you know, I, I didn't realize it when I went into it, but it was a year long contract. It was the longest contract I'd ever had um, as a performer. I'd always done side jobs and all the other things you do as a performer to kind of make the means, um, you know, when you're doing experimental theater, <laughs> you know, everything. <laughs> um, so and it, it, it was during that time that I'd moved to New York to do the show. 
And it was at that time that I was really becoming inspired by what was happening in the streets of New York and outside the walls of theater in in like public art and in um, museums that were starting to get, you know, installations were starting to get more um, immersive and more participatory and more interactive. And as I was in this show, you know, Forza Bruta is not your typical theater show. I, my career in the theater was was very experimental. And it was, you know, I was in the first immersive, quote unquote, you know, experience at Cirque du Soleil, where we were really interacting deep with the audience. And it was like a bar lounge experiment for them. And then Forza Bruta comes from the show De La Guardo, which was the, the show that blew my mind that I saw that I dedicated my life to doing physical theater in. And, and that show, the audience is a major part of that show. They're, you know, they stand, all the scenography moves through the audience and the audience interacts with the piece. And it's really not complete without the participatory nature of, of the, mm -hmm. the performer playing with the audience. And I was at that time wanting to be um, wanting to share that magic of those projects and, and the magic that I know and, and love from the theater that really changed my life when I saw the first show De La Guardo by those creators. I was wondering, can I give that same magic? Can I create that magic beyond the walls of theater in unexpected places? And that's how the Windmill Factory was born. Um, and that's how during those four years doing Forza Bruta, you know, I was essentially, you know, starting this company of, you know, the Windmill Factory, which, um, you know, was was trying to bring that magic beyond the walls of theater by creating, um, you know, installations, performances and events in unexpected places. Starting with public art um, was our first dream was to bring these kind of interactive public art pieces, you know, that would be on yeah, the streets think, of New York City. Am I remembering correctly you and, and maybe Adam swimming out in the Hudson River, putting <laughs> lights onto... Uh beams that were out in the water. <laughs> yep, that's right. That was the first major piece that we did called Reflecting the Stars. And it all started with, you know, like most of our pieces were, you know, I'm on my bike looking out over the Hudson River at these decaying um, pylons um, where an old transportation pier sticks out into the Hudson where trains used to back in and then uh, load ships. And I was looking at these old pier posts and thinking, oh man, wouldn't that be cool if they had lights on them? <laughs> And then that and then that evolved to like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if they were like the stars that we can't see in the city because of pollution? And wouldn't it be cool if we could look out over those stars like we look out at stars while we're laying on a pier in a remote location and look up at the sky? Wouldn't it be cool if we could look out at these stars and and have a, a newfound humility of being in the universe, mm. you know, as like, you know, a, a, a small, tiny you know piece of sand on this on this, you know, flying rock, you know, so. What we're started with, in... and we're all in a rock in space, but what started is, hey, wouldn't it be cool to put lights on those posts? Turned into like, oh, <laughs> let's actually invent a new technology of solar powered wireless LED lights. And then, you know, then you're like, well, how do we do that? Thank God we have a friend, Adam Berenswag, who's one of the most talented engineers, you know, on earth and is Shout out down, to Adam for sure. and, you know, down to clown and down for an adventure. So, you know, that's, uh, and then two and a half years later, we were able to pull that piece off. Um, so that's an interesting, so uh, let's, let's, I want to, I want to kind of hear how you got from there to the, but there's, there's a thread here of you really paying attention to what you're noticing. Like a lot of people would walk a bike around the city mm -hmm. and kind of go, oh, it's a bummer. It's pollution, you know, keep, keep biking. But you have this <laughs> insatiable drive to solve all these different things. And you're not shying <laughs> off of things like, Oh well, you know we can't. The, the the equipment doesn't exist. You you know you. I know you. You're like you call. For, do you know how to do this? Do you, could you do this? <laughs> what if what if you're like one of these people who really connects those constellations to to borrow the the stars? You know metaphor is nice one. Is, nice is, one. Thank you. Um, you're you're someone who. I think some, some some something was said in one of our previous podcasts. We edited it out, but I I think that a lot of transformation even personal transformation is collaborative. And I think mm. I, I see you as someone who truly, truly embodies that. I've never known you to do anything on, on your own, which is awesome. Like everything yeah. that you've done, you pulled in every, everybody. And so, you, and, and so, you, so you take, so you take a project like this and then, you know, and then you start to launch the windmill factory, which did some pretty big, as far as I remember, big events, big shows, stuff for other people. Do you want to tell us like a couple of the highlights? Yeah, sure. That, you know, that piece, Reflecting the Stars, went to be the poster child of Climate Week in New York City um, and was cited across the Internet by Wired and many, many different New York Times. And 
And that kind of led to a lot of different types of interactive installations, you know, from premier slots at Panorama or Coachella to um, designs for Nine Inch Nails or Metric or Fantagram, these big bands who are looking to connect with their audiences in different ways. So pulling mm. from a theatrical past, but also pulling from like this this newfound you know way of interacting with technology. Um, we did a lot of pieces at Burning Man. I think we still hold the um, the record for the most dangerous installation in Burning Man history. <laughs> Is that um, the one that I remember? With, yeah. Um. With the wedge, the 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 slide. And also oh, we hold the – yeah, the slide. We also I, – I believe um, many people have, have told me this work that we did called Pixel Forest, which was an extension of the kind of wireless LED work um, that mm -hmm. Adam kicked us off doing. Um, we partnered with Luma Geek and Parts um, and JoJo, this amazing LED company from San Francisco, to, to create these um, – basically tiny LEDs that fit inside of balloons. And then Leah, my wife, sings and controls all the balloons with her voice. That piece was featured as the cover piece of South by Southwest um, and was in their public uh, like eco light garden one year. And then we did it at Burning Man. And um, several people who are long, long term burners said that's the most beautiful installation they've ever seen at Burning Man. I think wow. for our tagline within um, within uh, Windmill Factory is manufacturing sublime manufacturing the sublime which i think mm. is you know speaking of transformation it's like our our goal learning from what i learned in the theater with these shows that had the potential to change my life and and did change the trajectory of my life and move me to dedicating to creating work like they they presented to me was to try to create these moments for people um with windmill factory that are at the level of the sublime which is you know it's it, it's it's an almost impossibility to think of actually manufacturing the sublime, the awe mm. of what mm. nature and of what God and of what you know is is like actually gives you the the moment of a what we call a sublime art pause, where the entire world stops and you reform how you think of things. Mm -hmm. And so I think that of all the 15 years that we have been in existence of Windmill Factory, we've maybe hit that a few times of all the works mm. we've done. You know, and I That's think. Interesting. Pick, so, so your whole thing is manufacturing the sublime, and yet you're telling me that you only did it, a, you like, truly in your a, your your assessment a handful of times. Correct. So, yep. what does that mean about the rest of the times? They were great. <laughs> they were great attempts. I hope. <laughs> I mean, it's like life, you know, and and especially when you're when you're creating things as an artist, you know, your vision you know, because of X, Y, and Z and this, this, that, and the other, whether it be limitations of time, budget, or, or scope, or whatever, you know, you can get to your fully completed vision, you know, I don't know, 25% of the time, you know, it's oh, like, that sounds generous. yeah, that would be yeah, amazing. Yeah, that would be amazing. I said that, and I was like, hmm, that would be really <laughs> great if that was our humble brag. <laughs> but, but I think I, I do think we got to the point with Windmill Factory where um, we you know, with several different projects, we're approaching that to go back to the surfing metaphor, the two paddle, you know, um, experience of, of, of having enough, having enough of a, of a, of a know-how that we kind of can understand how the audience is going to interact with a piece and be able to, to, um, to deliver something that allows them enough freedom to have a sublime moment for themselves, you know, but, I've, you know, some pieces, like we did a piece several years ago, half the people were outraged. And then a guy, another guy came up to me and said, I now understand how, like, why religion exists in the world. Okay. You know, like I, and, and it's, <laughs> so you can't, you can't create a piece for, for everybody. And, and that's the thing is like, if you're going for the sublime, often, you know, you're going to hit, um, you're going to create a piece that's, extraordinary for some and some people are going to be like oh that was fun you know um yeah. but i think that's the nature of most things in life you know yeah i well i mean i know it's something that you know as as a creative i've, I've struggled with and i've worked with hundreds and hundreds of creatives and it's something that we all struggle with is that is that balance between and i'm curious your thoughts on this right like uh well there's there's so there's so many things in what you just said i'm, I'm actually having a hard time figuring out where to go but um let's 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 go back to the beginning that and talking about getting to that two paddle moment um 
you know, you said with Fuerza Brute, you got to that, you know, that feeling where like you could walk in, you know, you could walk in pretty much and, you know, and, and knock it out of the park. Now with Windmill Factory, the challenge is now higher because you're not doing the same thing every time. Maybe there was some projects that you did a couple times. You did it here and here and here. I got to see some of your uh, interactive live theater, which was really cool. Uh, you know, obviously saw a bunch of things at Burning Man. I definitely saw someone get hurt on one of your things at Burning Man. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, just, sorry to a, anybody out there. Not, you know. not badly hurt. They were. It was yeah. sort of amusing. Um, but you, you sort of, you sort of said, okay, like here, like with with where's Fuerza Brute comfortable? Okay, now you're like, let's let's change the game. Let's make it even. Let's make it so that it's actually harder to get comfortable. Okay, and then you know, Windmill Factory is going. COVID hits. I remember being in some conversations about with you about uh, with you and and your team now about what you were thinking about doing. Tell me a little bit about how you went from everything you were doing to this this uh, this nowhere concept and what that is is aiming to do. Yeah, so at the top of the pandemic, you know, all of Windmill Factory's work is live. You know, it's very tangible. It's very like practical. It's a lot of like, you know, it's building on this immersive, you know, experiential theater of like really tactile, you know, interaction with the public, with the audience. And so, of course, our work, all of our work in the pandemic, we had finally gotten to the point where I think we had a whole year ahead booked out and we were like, oh, my God, we're we're on we're on the move. And uh, all that was canceled. (laughs) So, you know, and not only canceled, but like, you know, those the money wasn't coming in there was no you know there was no sustainability for our team and for you know um and for what we were looking at in the future so we we gathered a bunch of people on like a slack creative response group you know as you know and you know we were basically just kind of taking a step back and saying how could we be in service you know Mm -hmm. like what 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 are the things we can do right now that might be able to help people at this time and the thing that we'd always been very good at is bringing people together, you know, through culture and entertainment and through art. And what we saw was that there wasn't a way of really doing that in an interesting way online um, in a digital capacity. You know, um, you know, thank goodness we have video chat. You know, we're on video chat right now. We're recording this remotely. Um, you know, the te- that technology has advanced, you know, massively over the years to, you know, and think. Yeah, about they got they, they had a big boost in funding in 2020. <laughs> yeah, they might have had a little boost there. Um, things things so, are getting good for this kind of thing. Yeah, things are getting good for this kind of thing. And And you think about that, like that leap, like, you know, from when we had Skype for the first time, you know. And to where it is now, and then I'm on my phone recording this. And and but what we have now is a very static experience that doesn't involve yeah. the possibilities of what the pieces we were creating with Windmill Factory could be, which is like serendipity, uh, you know, adventure, mm-hmm. you know, like um, the unexpected uh, encounter, uh, you know, and, and and the feeling of a social gathering, you know, on the internet really doesn't exist like at the at, in 2020, you know, video games exist where you can pick up guns and go shoot people. And like, you know, uh, Roblox exists where I've you got, can go. I've got a teenager. I know. Yeah. 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 I, <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah. So, yes. but what we were shocked at is that there were, there weren't really any platforms that allowed us to be face to face as humans and have the kind of social mobility um, of a video game. And so that really was the, the, the initial impetus for building nowhere is like, can we have a place online that exists to bring humans together in a way that feels more natural in a way that feels, you know, uh, um, that feels and empowers the, the player much more to be able to like, I'm not stuck in this box. I can actually be like, Oh, there's, you know, there's Adam over there. I'm going to go talk to Adam. You know, speaking of Adam, Adam built the demo. (laughs) Same. It's good to know an engineer. It cer- certainly, and, and I and I know a few of the other folks you brought on early to build, you know, sort of build the alpha or whatever of the of the project. You just said a word that I remember very clearly. You talking we, when we were sort of talking about uh, doing this and maybe creating like a virtual kind of burn. And the thing that nowhere, nowhere does a lot of things. It's very cool, and and we'll post a link in the in the notes and make sure people can go check it out. Um, but something that's really interesting that you said then, that I'm just kind of connecting now is that idea of serendipity. Right. Like mm. you go to 
uh, uh, performance. You go to a potluck at your friend's house. You don't necessarily know who's going to be there. Um, and you're in this room and you might see someone and you can go over and talk to them or you can pass by a conversation and not participate in it because they're in a you know close conversation. You know, obviously Burning Man is kind of the, the gold standard of like weird serendipitous stuff happening. Yeah. But um, I thought it was really interesting that that that's the thing that you set out to solve. And in a way, it's almost like you brought creativity to this kind of online interaction. There's lots of ways. I mean, I, I do all kinds of stuff on, on Zoom and on here. And there's lots of ways to manufacture kind of creativity, creative conversations. You know, there's ways of there's lots of rules around facilitation and diverging and converging and all this different stuff that you can kind of structure. But there's there's not much that's that's that has that unstructured kind of ability to for opportunities to just kind of bubble up so in a way like this this um this idea of serendipity i'm I'm realizing in this moment now is that is that you're solving for creativity in this in this in this world yeah um that yes <laughs> i mean and that's it we're still trying to figure it out. You know, it's like, uh, you know, in 2020 when we were just like, oh, can we put video chat in a video game? And can we make it beautiful? Can we make it feel good? Can we make like socializing feel good? And I think, you know, we've achieved so much in the last four years as far as like technological leaps and like, and, you know, just to, to the point now where everybody really does say, like when they come to nowhere, they say, this is the most present I feel with others online. Wow, And I think there's so much power in that, you know, even though it's, it, it, I feel like, you know, where, whereas four years ago, I felt like, oh, we're right on the cusp of virtual worlds really taking off, you know, like we're, we're there, you know, it, it felt like I was quite a noob to this world and to technology and as a, you know, and now four years later, I feel like, wow, I, this could be just the beginning of this, you know, barely starting to go, you know, um, and I yeah. think that. That at that at this very beginning stage, the key for us and why we're building it, you know, still after four years, after the initial challenge of like, hey, can we make it feel good during the pandemic? Is like, why are we still doing it? Is that if I imagine a future without co-presence of humans on the internet and in these virtual worlds where it doesn't feel good, we're going to run into the same problems we have with social media today. And where social media is gone, you know, and expand on, that. expand on that. So, you know, all of us like got, you know, we went head over heels into social media. We were so excited about this promise of connection online, you know, and mm -hmm. then to find out that actually we're being monetized and we are the product, you know, and and we are actually being it's, it's a quite extractive, you know, system that has been set up. Um, and rather than connecting people globally it is you know which it has done many many you know with i i have to say facebook for windmill factory was a huge boon of like connecting sure. resources and people and sure. everything um but i think when you see the the issues that have arisen from you know these platforms being used by tools of misinformation um it's it's really it's it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a i'm just thinking it's like a metallic taste in your mouth over the <laughs> of like when you look back at that era of technology and the and and who was building these things so hoping to be approaching this as a as a person who is really cares about like humans and human interaction and has a lifetime of designing for human interaction that we can bring something to this to this new frontier of of media and technology that that is able to deliver something that brings the world closer together and doesn't pull us apart. Um, that's, that's kind of a beautiful sentiment to, um, to start to wind things down with. I definitely will, again, we'll post a link and I want everyone to, I want everyone to go check it out. It's actually a pretty fun platform to play on. That's a beautiful sentiment. And mm. um, I want to bookmark that for people. I don't hear a lot of CEOs, tech founders, I hear people paying lip service to these things, but um, in the way that you're doing it, and I, you know, I'm 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 on some of the back channel conversations about it. Um, I really appreciate the the real heart that you bring to this. So, 
I, I do have one question Thank about you. this whole journey. So you, you, um, you, you went from this very, you know, this, this performance phase to creating a company, a uh, windmill factory to now creating a whole tech platform bigger and, and, you know, and, and being a CEO and, and, uh, get, you know, getting different series of funding and going to this world that I'm, I'm guessing you didn't know a whole lot, uh, about maybe it'd been sort of next to, you don't have to answer this right away, but I am curious what, as you start to get to the edge of each of these moments where you're like, okay, like, I mean, one of the big ones, right. is like, you know, COVID hits, like, it's not just sort of like, oh, I wonder what the next thing is. It's like, we have to figure out what the next thing is. What gives you the courage that it takes to make some of these big, take some of these big risks? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I really don't know. Like, I guess I don't, I have never seen it really as courage. Um, I mean, look, I, I have been, um, I've been extremely blessed in my life to be, you know, to grow up, a you know, a white male at the time of white males, you know, at, in a, and I was really like, I had a really ideal childhood. My parents were middle class and I grew up in a small town. They supported me in, you know, in doing everything. They really let my brother and I, you know, yeah, really go after the things we wanted to go after. Um, I was able to have a really great education, had great, great teachers and mentors. And, um, and I think as a naturally just very social being, I gravitated towards things that I excelled in with my physical athletics and, and theater that gave me a lot of confidence and a massive community to then, you know, lean on when I needed them. And, you know, you're a hundred percent right. I, 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 I can't think of a project I've done alone because I don't like to work alone, you know? And so when I think about the, about being brave, I think about, just feeling supported and, you know, having this massive community behind me, you know, who, who support me, you know, and, and are there for me when I have questions or don't know how to create something or, you know, uh, or are willing to connect me and, and then are there to call me out if, you know, I'm, I'm messing up, you know, um, I've had an amazing community. I've had an amazing partner, um, my wife, Leah, uh, supports me, you know, day in, day out. And my, you know, work partner, um, Anna Constantino, who helped me start the windmill factory and start nowhere. Um, and my other co-founder, Max Obermiller, I mean, uh, Max Berkowitz, um, Max Obermiller is my, uh, swim coach who was <laughs> my springboard diving coach who is massively supportive as well. Um, so I've had these mentors and these, these partners, uh, that have made it feel quite tangible at all walks along the way. I think my courage comes from community and from others. You know, mm -hmm. you mentioned mm -hmm. that I've, you know, you don't know me to be a person who does things alone and hell no, I don't do things alone. Why would I do that? I'm like such a people person. I love people so much and I love collaborating with others. And I really believe that I'm, you know, we are, as a species are much better together. And so you know, I've had incredible support from my family as a kid uh, through sports and through theater with, you know, in creating with others that those those two activities really taught me to trust others and, and teamwork. And um, the theater I was in was extremely collaborative and doing 15 years of theater and performing. You build a yeah. massive network that then, you know, when you start a company, then, you know, I'm not starting that company from scratch. I'm starting that company with a massive amount of people and support um, to lean into. And then my partners over the years. A lot my, of experience and knowledge in that, in that community. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and then my, my lovely wife, who's an incredible inspiration and amused many times as an incredible artist, you know, she's always there for me to, you know, call me out if I'm like, you know, <laughs> if I'm not doing something and then I've, you know, I, I, I've never started a company alone. I started windmill factory with my partner, Anna Constantino, who's mm -hmm. an amazing rock and always believed that we could do everything, you know, and, and always knew how to find a way to do it. 
And, uh, and then we added Max uh, Berkowitz in Nowhere, who's an amazing designer and, and also is, you know, one of the most patient, and, you know, uh, you know, big believers in that you can do anything. So I think, you know, my courage comes from all the people around me and, and, and from the community that I've been blessed to have over the years. That is an awesome sentiment uh, to close on. And, and also, as you say that, you know, something that I think is true, I think is true, but I've, I've, like I said, I've known you for, for a long time now, and I know the people that you surround yourself with. And I think you were saying it about, you know, Anna and your and Leah and, and Max, but, you know, you surround yourself with people who do believe in in creativity, who do believe that you should be able to imagine things and try to figure out how to do them, who do believe that if you don't know how to do something, somebody does and might be interested in, in helping. I don't, I don't know if I know anybody through you who's kind of like a downer on that stuff. <laughs> you know, who we, surround, who we surround ourselves with is is so is so important. Um, it's something we talk about a lot in my you know in the work that I do with with my own you know my own creative clients with, with our creative group is about is about like what are the, you know never mind the voices in your head we've all got that that inner critic that's that gets pretty loud sometimes but it's it's totally. really important to have the people outside who are saying you know who say why not that sounds yeah. that's that sounds that sounds interesting like what 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 else could it look like what could i when how could i contribute yeah and to challenge you to think like yeah why why wouldn't you do something bigger than that you know and and to expand your your brain to think like you know oh why couldn't we do a public art installation on the hudson river you know why couldn't we build a tech platform Oh, it looks like a tech tech platform. Wouldn't that be fun? It's like what? Huh? I don't know how to do it. what. Really? It's you know. It's one of my favorite <laughs> questions when I'm working with people who like you know who are doing things like you're doing. You know, when they're saying, okay, I want to create X, Y, and Z, and instead of saying, you know, okay, let's let's figure it out, you say, okay, what's what's like a what's like a ten x version of that? Yeah. And like, well, I can't do that. Why not? But what what yeah. would it look like? What oh, would it be? Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is a great, it. it's a great, it? like, this is a great thing to learn from technology and venture capital <laughs> is like, you know, like what, what's a hundred X, you know, it's like, what, what would be the largest conceptual possibility of human transformation that you could think about? And why are we not working on that? You know, um, I love that. And I love that you're working on it. I love that you're working on it with nowhere. Um, speaking of, um, do you want to tell people the where they can find or you the other thing that thing? I I just want to say one more thing about the community building because I think it's a trope right now of like oh build with a community start a business as a community that's the way to start a business and that takes time and it takes so much effort of showing up and that is one of the most important things I think that you know in my life that I've tried to do is just show up for people and that way when you know whenever, you know, I need people in my life, I know that they will show up for me because I've been there for them. And I think that's like, that's something people forget about when they're starting communities is like, you know, you have to show up, you know, you have to be the one that's there for people and be the one that is, that they can count on and also be the one that's there, you know, with people ever ask me for help or support, I'm always there. Um, I can, I can confirm, I can confirm that. Yeah. yeah. That's an, that's a that's a really good that's a really good lesson. I it's funny I I'm, I'm I just took a course from this guy who he 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 does a lot of like kind of nuts and bolts about how to build online communities, online memberships. And I was curious to learn from him because he's, he's he does a really great job. Um and there was a you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of people in the group and a lot of people were sort of starting from scratch and it was you know, it was it was amazing how many people were sort of brought back. You know, they're like, I want, I want to, I want all these people to kind of come to me, and we're like, well, how do you start? Start with the people you know. Start with the people that you're already. You know, it sounds daunting, right? Like, oh, okay, I've got to go find people and go show up for them. This is a ton of work. But look at your life. There's there's people that you know that you're already showing up for. Start there. Yeah. Start there. Yep. You're already doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You just happen to have been doing it for 30 or however long. <laughs> <laughs> I also happen to be blessed by like being one of the most social butterflies ever. So, you know, 
making the extra effort to go to like three things on a, you know, Thursday night where you know, you've got an art, you've got an art opening, you've got a birthday party and you got another thing. It's like most of that is fun for me, you know, and it gives, it gives me energy. So I am very lucky in that, in that way. You are um, extroverted. Is that right? I am I, correct. Yeah. I, I mean, I would, I would have guessed that, but you're, no, you I can't know. imagine you'd guess that from my work or <laughs> knowing me for 15 years. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, this has been awesome. I feel like we have a lot more that we could talk about, but I love, I love just how we, uh, that through your journey that we came to this idea of how important it is to, you know, start, start with, start with community, start with showing up, start with building trusting relationships. I think there's so much that can come out of that. Um, speaking, speaking of, if people want to explore yeah. these kinds of things in your platform, which I can confirm is, kind of there's like all these little and we don't have to go over all the features but there's like so many things in nowhere that you that you don't find anywhere else they, they don't exist on any of these other platforms yeah. i remember doing some evaluations with you and there was like lots of play, and it really did seem like oh this is the, we've already jumped the shark on some of this stuff but no one was doing what you guys are doing where can people go and kind of explore the platform meet up with friends that kind of thing i think the best uh spot to go the the website is nowhere.io um, and we just built this really cool tool that allows you to do kind of like Google Meet, but with AI generated worlds um, with spatial audio and video chat in these virtual worlds. And that's meet.nowhere.io. And we can toss all the links in there. Um, so and we just launched a, an amazing like uh, our first game that we built in Nowhere um, with Upland, one of our partners. So we can include that in there, too. And it's really fun. Like, please do. Yeah, I we got you showed me a little bit before we started recording and it looks kind of amazing. It's um, and I know that it's got it's not just like it's not just like another thing, because I know it's got all the Nowhere uh, technology behind it and connection technology behind it, which is super impressive. John, this has been awesome. I appreciate you taking the time. I know that you've got four other parties to go to right after this. So uh. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. I uh, it's always always awesome to hang and chat with you, Mark. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you uh, see you soon. Thanks for listening. John is such a mensch. Am I right? Well, look. If you enjoyed this episode, please do us a favor: like it, comment on it, and do share it with your friends. Everything that you do to share and like our posts helps us create more of these things so that we can bring more of these great guests to you. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you on the next episode.